All right, so let us get this party started. We're going to talk about the the flood, um, picking up uh, from last week where we looked at the fall of humanity, starting with Cain uh, and his murder of his brother, Abel, and then on down the line. And um, as we looked at Seth's family, we saw that they were more God-fearing. They, the people called out to the Lord during this time of Seth's life and his descendants lived longer, but Cain's family, uh, we saw um, development of culture, and, but also violence. And at the end of, at the very beginning of chapter six, we see that the sons of God and the, the daughters of men were intermingling in a way that was not good. Um, and what that means, um, there's mystery there. Are they demons that are um, taking advantage of um, people? And, you know, that's a, a major theory in all of this. And so, um, so as we see this, God sees the, the wickedness of humanity and um, he sees the, that in their heart is violence all the time. And, and so he has a plan to do essentially a creation reset. And so today we're going to be going through uh, Genesis 6 uh, verses 9 through chapter 9 verse 17. Uh, and so this is going to be the largest chunk of scripture that we have looked at so far. Um, and so it's going to, there's going to be a lot to cover, but a lot of it is fairly repetitive um, as we walk through the event. So we'll read large chunks and then talk about it. Um, and what's interesting is Noah's uh, story is 10 generations from Adam, and then it's going to be 10 generations to Abraham. And so right here in the middle of these, um, these major figures is Noah. And, you know, 10 is a significant number. It's kind of a, a whole complete number um, in biblical numerology. Um, but so there's some significance there. But it's also um, just an interesting piece here as we look at Cain's family. We didn't see called out long life in that uh, family, but in the Seth line, we do see long life. And then it's going to be after the flood that the age of people starts to drop precipitously. And so um, that's uh, gonna, it's, it's going to be something that we'll notice. But then also, it's just interesting how, like, in the genealogies, we saw the narrator just kind of flying through, like, thousands of years at a time, basically, to then get to Noah. And the most of the events from um, this passage that we're going to look at tonight are one year in the life of Noah. And so we see this huge overview of, of history happening and then one year and then it zooms back out and then it gets close again to, to Abraham. So I just find that a little interesting um, as the narrator is telling this story, uh, the ebbs and flows that where he zooms in and zooms out. Um, and so in the year uh, that we look at, we see the flood, which kind of giving us a preface for what's happening in the flood. Uh, essentially, God is going to do a recreation and wipe out the seed of the serpent uh, and, and its corruption on the earth uh, while sparing the, the seed, the descendant of Adam and the woman. And so God is continuing his line to lead us to the point where we will... Um, ultimately see this fulfilled in Jesus where he, the, this serpent will head will be crushed. Um, that's going to happen with Jesus in the, uh, through the cross, uh, his death and resurrection. Um, but so God is preserving his intention, uh, to lead us to grace in Jesus. Um, but yeah, so there's some weird, some interesting echoes between, um, Adam and Noah that we'll look at as well uh, towards the end of our time together. And there's a lot of questions about the, the nature of the flood and um, if it was global or localized and there's all kinds of different uh, debates around that issue. Um, and so, you know, we're not going to 
have time to get really in depth on the nature of those debates. But as we're reading, the, the kind of the perspective that I'm taking to the text is the clearest, most uh, faithful reading to scripture. Because why I'm not so much concerned about like matching scientific da data and all that kind of stuff as much as saying like, why did the writer tell us this? That's really what I want to focus on. Why did the writer tell us this? So let's jump in. Uh, Genesis 6, starting in verse 9, and I'll read through 22. <clears throat> this is the account of Noah and his family. And the account there is that Toledot phrase again, uh, the, the, the book of generations. So it's a section header uh, for us in the book of Genesis. Uh, so this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. <clears throat> so in this first section, we're, we're, show, we're told that Noah is righteous and blameless. Uh, and he is interesting because he, he's comparing to the rest of humanity, which we don't really know anything about the rest of humanity specifically other than they are corrupt. Um, the, and something that we say at Creekside um, is that sin breaks everything. It breaks our relationship with God. It breaks our relationship with one another. And it breaks our relationship with creation itself. That's all part of the, the curse uh, that we, the curse accounts that we see in Genesis 3. Sin breaks everything. And over time, sin continued to break uh, the lives of the people on the earth. And their hearts were filled with violence all the time. They corrupted all of the earth. And um, from Genesis 4 with the murder, Cain's murder of Abel, then we see Lamech escalating. Somebody attacks him, and so Lamech killed that person and then claimed to be a uh, right of vengeance 77 times over. The trend of humanity is not that humanity is getting better, they are getting worse as we read through Genesis. And, um, and so as we think through even now, like people have this idea of human progress, like we are really getting better. But I look at the, the state of the world that we're in and I see like the trend of humanity all the way back from Genesis to now is still left to our own devices. We will break everything. We'll break everything. But Noah walked faithfully with the Lord. He was different. And, and we don't have any law code uh, that Noah was following at this point in Genesis. There is simply a relationship with God that, you know, initiated by God was, Noah was selected by God. He was elect, chosen by God to have this relationship with. He walked with the Lord. So echoing back to Enoch, echoing back to Adam uh, and the pre fall like god wants to have relationship with people and as we read through the old testament we will see that god's particular relationship uh is going to be with individuals more often than with large groups for a long time um until we get to israel where you know god will talk about israel as being like a son to him um 
And, and until then, we're going to see, you know, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, um, like kind of individuals. And then we'll see prophets among the people of Israel who are, have a special relationship with God, um, but none of them as close as Noah uh, or Abraham or Moses. And so <clears throat> as we think through, though, his relationship with God, Noah's relationship with God, um, his righteousness is really tied to doing everything just as God commanded him. And, and so as we think about that dynamic, you know, he, whatever God said, Noah did. And we see that in him, in his act of building the, the ark, uh, really introducing uh, up to this point in Genesis, the idea of boats. Um, you know, this is a very large boat and Noah did what God told him to do. Uh, and there's this consensus among scholars that this is completely God's choice. It's not something that Noah woke up and said, I'm going to choose to honor the Lord. Noah was chosen by God, and it was completely by grace of choosing that God is going to use Noah to preserve humanity into like this reboot after the flood. And, um, when we read this story that way, <clears throat> it all seems really unfair. And, you know, one of the things that we struggle with in our culture is fairness in relationship to God and God's grace uh, in the Bible is his prerogative and he chooses to be graceful. And if we just look at it as, fair or unfair, then we miss, we really miss the point of what God is doing is God is choosing to restore. God is choosing to, uh, to, to rescue people. And when we get to Jesus, we see that he is choosing to die for the sins of the world while uh, we don't have to die for our own sin. And that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair to Jesus, but God chooses to do that. And so his grace is something that we can't always uh, look at through fairness. But when we think about Noah's righteousness is he's received grace. And so he is faithful. And so in our own lives, if we have received grace, that grace is not fair. We do not deserve it. <clears throat> but grace generates faithfulness and integrity. And it, it is not that faithfulness and integrity generates grace. And so that's an important distinction to, to make. And so while God is revealing his plan to Noah, um, it is <clears throat> not a, a great encouraging plan, right? He is going to destroy humanity to cleanse the earth of their corruption and violence. And last week we saw that it was not anger that motivated God to destroy humanity. It was grief. He regretted what he had created. And so the idea of God having grief um, is something that, you know, we have a, a tension with as well, because we, you know, God's emotion is something that I think people are uncomfortable with sometimes um, because he's God and he's unchangeable. And so how can God have emotion? And that's one of the things that the writers of scripture are showing to us is that God, God does have emotion. But his emotion is rooted in holiness, um, and and he desires better for his creation. And so, um, so even as he's destroying humanity, it's not because he just wants to give up. It's because he, he's going to restart, uh, el eliminate the serpent seed, and try to change human the course of humanity. <clears throat> so he's going to destroy humanity. He's going to destroy the earth. Um, and if we think about the flood and, and what's going to happen, like the old maps would have been completely changed. And so um, it's one of the reasons why like trying to find the Garden of Eden is kind of a fool's errand. The, the maps, the earth itself could have been completely redone as a result of breaking open the floodwaters and the aquifers and all that from underneath. Like it would have changed, changed everything. Um, Noah and his family will be saved through Noah's obedience and build the ark. 
Um, and so they're going to build a boat and God gives specific dimensions. So the boat is 450 feet long. So I know we don't measure in cubits. So it's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 50 cubits or uh, 45 feet high. And so it's a big, long rectangular, basically boat. Um, but it is, you know, it's huge. It's uh, one and a half si the length of a football field, just in width or, or length. And so it's a big boat. This is probably the biggest boat anybody had ever made in history to this point. Um, like I love going and looking at the, the sound and seeing those like super tankers coming up from the, the port of Seattle and Tacoma, like the big, huge freighters. Like those things are gigantic. And like Noah's Ark would have been not dissimilar, like as you look at it, like when you first see it, it's like, well, that is huge. How does that float? Um, but God said, make a boat. And Moses, or Noah made the boat. Um, there are other flood uh, accounts in ancient history. And the most fam famous one is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in that, the the main character he builds a a a basically a pyramid type thing a ziggurat that really wouldn't have floated um but just the dimensions and stuff is like this is weird this would never work and so here when we think about moses's or moses i i sorry noah's ark that got the instructions he gave him it's actually like boat shaped and it could have worked um, so that is interesting. We also see here that the, this is the first introduction of a covenant in the Bible. And covenant, covenantal theology are very important throughout the Old Testament and into the ministry of Jesus. Um, and so the covenant that God is going to establish with Noah will be explained more fully later on in the passage. But here, God is just promising Noah that he's going to make a binding relational agreement with him and his family um, so that so Noah is chosen by God's grace to be the one through whom humanity will, res will be rescued and the covenant is going to be that binding relationship after the flood. And uh, God also tells Noah that he will bring Noah God will bring the animals to Noah and that's a major, undertaking as you think through like bring two of every animal male and female for the future of their uh, of their species and so um so that's the plan and noah's gonna walk that plan um but noah is not god does not bring noah all the lumber and he, god tells noah to go get gather all the food necessary for all the all the animals and for his family that are going to be on the ark together. So this project probably took many years to actually build, build the ark. Uh, it would have been a major undertaking. Um, and so they get to it. Um, and in the 600th year is when we see the flood actually come. Uh, and so let's pick up in uh, verse 7-1. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its female, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. And also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals of birds and all the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, 
on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with their wife, with his wife and the wives of his three sons entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. So uh, you know, God is saying to Noah or at the beginning of this, get in the boat, the storms are coming. Um, and so again, because he is um, faithful and complete, he follows the Lord's commands and gets in the boat. Uh, but we're giving a new bit of information here because instead of just two of every kind of animal, the Lord tells Noah that there are going to be seven pairs of clean and unclean animals. And this is another indication of something new to us in the text because we have not had any revealed clean or unclean animal list uh, that will be more fully developed for the people of Israel in the Mosaic Covenant, in, um, in, in, the, in the books of the law. And so there probably was some kind of cultural understanding of clean and unclean animals. Um, like Jewish people were not the only people who didn't eat pigs because people probably saw the pigs and saw what the pigs ate and they said, pigs are gross, don't eat pigs. Um, so that kind of thinking may have been a part of the larger cultures in the earth. Um, and so the reason that we see seven for these uh, clean animals could be because they, uh, at the end of the, the flood, I mean, the Lord is bringing them out and Moses actually makes offerings. And so he may have offered some of these clean animals, um, but also to replicate the species more readily, to have more matching pairs, uh, to keep breeding, uh, the, the seven clean animals would create a better uh, gene pool to work with. So um, it's interesting just the way that God thinks through, like I would like more clean animals than unclean animals. So I'm going to make sure that happens. Um, and I, there was a movie that came out years ago with Steve Carell called Evan Almighty. It's not a very good movie. I do not recommend it, but he's basically um, a modern day Noah. And so, um, uh, yeah, so Mo, uh, Noah is a, uh, like we see like these animals coming and like every time I think about that, I see this um picture of Steve Carell waiting for animals to come to him. And I know I keep saying Moses when it's Noah. Sorry about that. I know it's Noah, but these stories, like I have a hard time just mentally sometimes keeping them straight. So I will work on it. Um, and so he gets this countdown, seven days, the flood is going to come and all of this came to pass. And something that I find interesting in this, and there's a small little details there, getting into the ark and the animals are in the ark. And as the waters start to rise, the text says, the Lord shut him in. And um, like the Lord closed the door of the ark uh, and secured him inside of it. And sometimes there are situations in our lives that maybe feel completely out of our control. Um, and like the, the ark situation, Noah as it's all happening, like it's probably overwhelmed with watching the water rise and like, how are we going to do this? But the Lord shut him in, the Lord to protected him. Uh, and so this is just one more sign of God's faithful protection and provision for Noah. Um, and so Noah continues to trust the Lord and the rains come and the waters of the deep rise the um the like aquifers the springs all just start to rupture out and the water keeps coming and coming and coming verse 17 
For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth and the waters increased. They lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Everything, every living thing that moved on land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. This is a very intense account of the flood. And the writer is intentionally using repetition to drive home the point of the complete and total destruction of all that Noah knew. Every person, every animal, every bird, gone. And even the things that the, the fear could be that the, um, the cultural artifacts of their time, you know, those things could also have been wiped out, you know, and, and the, the author is trying to help us see the, the intensity of this moment. And it wasn't just a little rain. It was a lot. It was a lot of rain. Uh, I love nature documentaries and like the planet earth series. Like those are super fun um, and just really interesting. And one of the things that I, I watched a couple of years ago was about um, specifically a river of clouds in the, uh, in, over the Amazon. The clouds are so dense and they are moving so fast that it is, is a river. And imagine all of that river falling to the earth um, over 40 days and you know, it, oh, going over all of the mountains so that the boat that Noah and the animals and this family are in could, would be able to clear the mountain. Like they wouldn't scrape the bottom. Like that's how much water is on uh is is coming into the earth and you know when people talk about things like climate change and fearing like major floods like this is something that we like we shouldn't just dismiss the idea that like that could happen because that's the kind of devastation like if all the global ice caps melted like that's the kind of flood water that would be out and released into the earth and like that's intense um, and so the scripture is talking about this. And why did the flood happen? Because humanity had corrupted themselves and creation. And so like even thinking about our own situation now, like how are we doing? Are we mindful of our relationship with God, with each other and creation? Because if we're left to our own devices, we will destroy everything. <laughs> And even look, reading, like watching movies like Waterworld, which again, not a great movie, um, but the idea of a global flood, like that would dramatically change everything about everything if there are there is no land. And so, um, so the water here in in Noah's life, like what was he thinking in in the boat? God said he would preserve us. God said he would protect us. And like this water can't last forever, but he is still there waiting. And one of the big debates about this in conservative and liberal uh, scholars in their work is the extent of the flood. And there's several questions as to, is this a global flood? Like the whole earth was completely covered with water or is it just localized to uh, the land that Noah would have known? Um, 
And part of the challenge is thinking through um, the, the flood, like there isn't actually solid geological evidence that the flood happened. Like they look forward and like different silt levels in all of the earth as they like the different strata and like you'd be able to tell like, hey, here's a big band that is consistent around all of creation um, on all of the earth that says that there was a major water event. Um, and so that's one of the challenges is like just looking at the data, like it doesn't look like we can't find it. But just because we can't find it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, and so like we may be looking the wrong way. We may, may be thinking about it uh, inaccurately. And so when we think through the, uh, the, the extent of the flood, whether or not it was a global event or a localized event, the point that the writer of scripture is making for us is that God is, is resetting humanity. That's the point of the story. And the picture of the earth completely covered by water is very suggestive for us as well, because if we go back to Genesis, in the beginning, the earth was formless of, and void, and the spirit of God hovered over the deep. And now we find ourselves in a very similar environment where the world is formless and void and the spirit of God, the, the breath of God, the wind of God is hovering over the deep as God is about to recreate um, and to, to, to reboot the, the, the creation with Noah and his family. So uh, let's pick up in verse eight or chapter eight, verse one. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground, but the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back in, back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's six hundred and first year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and wife and his son's wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark one kind after another. I, I, so we see when the floods start, God closes the door. And then as the, the rain stop and they're on the, the waters for 150 days, God remembered Noah and the animals. I love that. God remembered Noah. It shows God is trustworthy 
as the covenant partner. Um, and he starts to do the work of bringing the waters down. And the wind comes, the water recedes. Again, that word wind is the same as breath and spirit. It's ruach. The wind comes. So the same, the water that was over the, the, the deeps in Genesis 1, uh, that's that, the, the spirit that was over the waters like is now happening. The wind is happening again, driving the waters away. Um, but water takes time to leave. And I remember uh, when I was younger, like watching the news, like seeing a major flooding event in the Midwest as the Mississippi River rose and like just seeing this, this footage on the news for days that like that was intense amounts of flooding. Um, even like more recently, like Hurricane Katrina and the flooding that happened in, in Louisiana, like that, like the water had nowhere to go. And it took days to dry up and to move in, in, away in some places. Um, and so as we think about this major flood event, like where's the water going to go? It takes 150 days to really get moving away um, from, uh, from where Noah was in the ark. And as it goes away, it, it rests on the top of the mountains of Ararat. And there's people who are looking for the ark. Um, and there's people who think they have found it using satellite imagery and like outlines of large structure um, in these mountains. But it's hard to get to the plate. Like these would be in uh, like Turkey area. Um, and so it might not be easy to get to those places politically and for different reasons. But ultimately, whether or not we can find the ark is the same as whether or not we can find Eden. It isn't ultimately the purpose is not us being able to find these places. And if our faith re is only resting on finding these places and these items, then our faith is misplaced. Uh, and so we need to like be okay with like, there are some things that we will never find. And that's all right. Um, and so as we think about Noah's life here, he is basically going to spend a year in a zoo boat um, with his family. And as we think about our own situation, um, you know, if you have kids at home, you know, we're going to be largely at home for a while still. But we have freedom to leave. We have freedom to uh, to do things and go to the store. And, um, and, you know, we may have lockdown, but we're not nearly as locked down as Noah and his family. And if you think about like what animals do over the year, like he went into the ark with a handful of animals, but they were probably making more animals while they were on the boat. Um, and even him, Shem and Japheth, they maybe had kids, you know, at least, you know, a kid in this year. Like so much of the world uh, is just in the boat, but the boat is still a world unto itself. They're still doing world things. Um, and so I just find that really interesting. Like there's th stuff about this event that the, the writer doesn't tell us, but it would have happened. Like it would make sense that these things could have happened while they were on the boat. And so as the waters start to recede, they see the, the mountaintops and like, all right, maybe we can go. And so um, he tests it out by sending birds because birds can go a ways and see what's happening. And if there's nowhere to go, they'll come back. And so he starts with the raven um, and a raven is a big bird that can fly pretty far. Um, and if it finds food, like a like dead animal somewhere, it can eat it and it would be fine. And so the raven doesn't come back, um, but then he sends out a dove and the dove flies around, can't find anywhere to land, comes back. Then seven days later, it goes out, flies around, comes back this time with a branch in its mouth. And that's the indication that, the, okay, there's plants. The water's receded enough that plants are uh, able to be uh, seen and you know the, the dove, brought some of the plant back and then released the dove again and the dove doesn't come back. And so 
that's a that's the sign. Like there is hope here. the The waters have receded, um, and so they're able to move on. And so God says, "Leave, get out of the ark." Um, and so that's where we're at. So I'm going to read the rest of our section today. So from 20 through 917. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's a beautiful thing that happens here. Uh, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will I never cease. God, uh, then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by human shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those who came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the whole earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and li every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds. It, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have, I've established between me and all life on the earth. Okay, so the first thing that happens when they get out of the boat is they start making offerings. And again, just like Cain and Abel, these offerings are not tied to a sacrificial code uh, or commands or covering over of sin. It is more like just a offering of thanksgiving, of worship, and saying, God, thank you for preserving us. And God smelled the offering, and he, it pleased him because everybody loves the smell of barbecue. Um, and so uh, Noah's family, they are doing this, and... Um, He's, sac he's sacrificing the some of the clean animals, um, and, but this is where God establishes a, his this covenant. In chapter six, he said, "I will establish a covenant," and here in this section is where he um, codifies it. And as we think through Scripture, there are some folks who look at Scripture and say that covenants are temporary, and like each one is superseded by the next one, and so one will go away. Um, but the truth is really is that as we see um, covenants in the scriptures is they they more that they build on each other and so the the covenant of no with Noah is still a part of human reality it didn't go away there isn't going to be another flood um, like Noah's flood in all of human history and even the co the covenant with Abraham like it continues on through Jesus and is we are seeing the covenant being lived out even in the church as we are 
a blessing to all nations as faithful descendants um, or descendants of Abraham by faith. And the Mosaic covenant is the closest thing that we could say is, is fulfilled, but there are still principles of the covenant that we hold on to um, even after the cross, not to say that the law saves us, but that there are principles in the law that show us the path of blessing that God has made possible. And so covenants are important uh, throughout the Bible um, and specifically the covenants with God and humanity. And as you think through covenants, and we'll have a lot of time to unpack these different covenants, but it's usually a greater king is, com uh, is coming to a, a servant state and the, the, the conquering king makes a covenant with the, the conquered and is saying, I will protect you. And there are like commands and demands and there are blessings and curses with covenants. And here we don't have it all fleshed out. But what we have in this covenant um, and that is consistent with other covenants is it's initiated by God. Noah did not start this covenant. God did. God is the greater party. Uh, there are signs that often are seals for the covenant. Um, and in the covenant, God makes promises uh, for his people. And so here we have um, commands from the Lord. He commands Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply. Um, he gives blessings. He establishes humanity's dominance over creation, the stewardship of creation. Um, he gives them opportunity to eat meat. And so we praise the Lord for that. Um, before that, I don't know if everybody was vegetarian, but here it is like you can now eat meat. And so that's cool. Um, but even in the eating of meat, there is a demand that the people are mindful of the value of life. And so when it says drain all of the blood out of the meat, it's um, to make sure that all of the lifeblood is gone, that you're not trying to eat a living animal or um, something that is part of a cultic ritual, like eating the blood of the animal, because that is all part of the, uh, the life force of the creature. Um, and he seals the covenant with the rainbow. And the bow is the same word that we would use for the bow, and like bow and arrow. And so there is a sign here that God is hanging up his, his weapon uh, that he used against humanity. Like the clouds are rolling in and we see the rain come. But when the rain leaves, we're reminded that God's not going to use this as a weapon against creation. Again, he hung up his bow. And, and so he has surrendered that tool of warfare. And so this is a, a recreation event uh, here. And so there's similarities between um, Adam and Noah's family that I'll, I'm going to just kind of go through real quick. And we'll see more of this next week. So a little bit of forward promotion. Uh, so um, both worlds with Adam and Eve were created out of a watery chaos. Both Adam and Noah are uniquely associated with the image of God. God is preserving the image of God in humanity. Um, that's why you can't kill people and because of the image of God. Both walk with God. Both rule the animals, Adam by naming, Noah by preserving. God repeats almost word for word the commission to be faith, be fruitful, to multiply, and to rule the earth. Both work the ground, and we're going to see that Noah plants a vineyard, um, and both follow similar patterns of sinning, Adam by eating, and Noah by drinking, having a little too much of the fruit of the vineyard after he made some wine. Um, their sin uh, results in immediate shameful nakedness connected with knowing and they are clo both clothed by another, and we'll see that next week. Both have three named sons. As a, rem uh, as a remote, a remote result from Adam's sin, judgment falls on all, and from Noah's sin, a curse comes on Canaan, uh, which is his grandson. Among their three sons is judgment and hope, division into elect and non-elect. And so there are some very similar things happening between Noah and Adam. Um, and that's where we're going to wrap up with this section. That's the end of tonight's reading. But the, there's a recreation event, and we are restarting, and there will be another toledot in a few uh, sections here, and we'll see that God is going to start to build the nations 
in the coming weeks. So the descendants of Noah, uh, we're going to see the Tower of Babel, uh, the confusion of languages, and then we're going to see our main man, Abraham and his family. And then so like this big, huge epic of time is slowed down for Noah, and then it's going to get big again, and then it's going to slow down for Abraham and his family. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, Genesis uh, 6, 7, and into 8 and into 9. So um, any questions? I know Chris had a question about dinosaurs. So uh, it, Chris, do you want to ask that question? <laughs> I just, that was my, that was just, you know, just curious about dinosaurs. That's all. Yeah. I them being on the ark, but I, you know, they don't mention them. Right. They don't mention them specifically. And, you know, they were very big. <laughs> so, like, um, I don't know how they would have all fit in there. Another thing to keep in mind is we don't know how long, we, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in creation before the fall like they we have an age for adam but like like i said in our earlier week like why would you count your age if you don't think you're ever going to die you know so there's there might be a demarcation that like the 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 dinosaurs could have existed and became extinct in that window where we just don't know but i don't know um there's also large water dinosaurs that uh, could have survived after the, like during the flood and after. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as well. Cause like uh, in scripture, we do see references to Leviathan and Leviathan is a large water monster basically is the way that it is described. Um, and so there could, that could be reference to a dinosaur. Um, I listened to a, a scholar this this week talking about Jonah, and he, he was talking about some of the theories around the large, the great fish in Jonah. Um, and there are some people who think that it is a, a, a reference to Leviathan or a sea dragon. Um, and so like, there's all kinds of theories that people are like, this could be a dinosaur. This could be a dinosaur. We don't know. Um, Fish, fish did survive. Yeah, fish did survive. Fish were in the water. Obviously. So, so they were fine. Into the ark, so. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of mystery. But even like thinking through the ocean itself, there's a lot we do not know about the ocean. There's a lot, like that is really the undiscovered land, area, land, <laughs> the undiscovered environment of our earth the ocean is still vastly unexplored. So there's, there could be very large creatures in the ocean, even now, like giant squid is a thing. So um, yeah, mm. it's fun to think about. <laughs> so, <laughs> could there be a dragon? Kraken. A kraken? Well, I know there will be kraken in, <laughs> in just a few, few short months. We're gonna have our NHL team, so that's exciting. Um, so, yeah. Uh, any other any other questions? There, this is a uh, interesting story. Like, this is something that we tell to children. Like, there are so many like children's murals. I've been to people's houses where they painted Noah's Ark scenes on the kids' wall in their bedroom. It's like, look at all the cute animals. It's like, but if you look down, like, there's a bunch of dead bodies in the water. Like, that's <laughs> that's weird, guys. So. <laughs> That interesting, interesting story. Um, when they came out of the ark, did they? Was there enough time that the bodies had decomposed and there was just bones? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, but if, like yeah. even thinking about the raven, when the raven left, um, like it's a raven is a carrion bird. Like they eat, they're scavengers. They eat dead creatures, and so there was probably something that like the raven was like this is a good place for me to camp out i'm gonna stay here and i'm gonna i'm gonna eat so like it's the devastation of the flood um the text does not get into how uh how cataclysmic it really was but it was 
they would have destroyed so much. Um, and it, when we look at next week and Noah's wine incident, you know, we, we ha have an understanding today of something called PTSD. Like this would have been a very traumatic experience that the people had to figure out how to cope with. And so Noah drinking a little bit too much wine, um, like I wouldn't like throw too many stones at him at this point in, in history. So, yeah. I do have a question. And I know that's not a surprise at this what? point. <laughs> yeah. Right. By the way, I just want to say, I was giving you a hard time about my comment. It just, it seemed appropriate. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, I, I can take it. I, I have always had a problem with Moses and Noah in my brain. I know they're different, <laughs> but they're both, they're both old. They're both they have old. beards and, and, you know, that had something traumatic happen. I mean, yeah, go figure. And they were both saved by water vessels. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, Noah, it, the only other time that the, the word ark is used is when Noah's parents make an ark for him and put him in the river. You mean Moses, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's hard. <laughs> so your question. <laughs> so my question, now this is potentially just a hypothetical question, but so God, we, we understand that God is the beginning and he is the end. He's at both points in time. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me wonder sometimes like how evil were people before the flood where God had to destroy everything and start from scratch or start with Noah. Mm -hmm. And I think about some of the things that I see going on nowadays and it makes me wonder, okay, so we read about Sodom and we read about Gomorrah and how God destroys both of those places. Uh, he sends an angel to go and destroy both of those places. So it makes me wonder like how evil was everything prior to the flood for him to just literally wipe out the entire earth. Um, when we have, again, Sodom and Gomorrah, and then you look at some of the other things that happen, like, it just makes me wonder, like, what the heck, how bad were these people, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, pretty bad. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that is important is, like, right after Cain kills Abel, mm -hmm. he says, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. And so if one person's death mm. leads to God's like, God hearing it and grieving, like this is what happened. This is awful. Um, as that grows with humanity, the crying out from the ground, like it would have probably like, I mean, I mean we can't know because we're not God, but like it right. would have, been like, <clears throat> devastating like to hear the crying out like these are people made in my image who are killing each other they're so corrupt um and the grief of god leads to the flood um so it was it was bad it was really bad and even like sodom and gomorrah like we look at that story and we see the the angels that go and visit lot um, and like the wickedness of the people towards those angels, yeah. but there was more than just like homosexual behavior happening in Sodom and Gomorrah that was grieving God. That was an evidence of wickedness, but the, the scripture talks about them as being, um, harsh with the poor and the vulnerable and not caring for people like that. That was all part of it as well. Like, the, the things that we do to other people grieve God. Uh, and so when we look at like now, one of my um, theories of atonement is that on the cross, Jesus bore all of the sin of humanity. And so on the cross, like it crashes into Jesus and Jesus is he is holding on to it 
on the cross and like essentially absorbing it for us. But when we look to the coming judgment, that's when all the people who have already placed their faith in Jesus, that judgment skips over us because we're in Christ, but that judgment is going to go somewhere. And so right now we are in this moment where like God is holding back the full measure of his wrath because of Jesus, but that won't be forever. Jud the judgment will come. Um, and so when people say things like Katrina was judgment on America because of abortion and gay marriage or, or, you know, all the things that people say, like, I don't think that is, I don't know if we can make that claim <laughs> and with, with a strong confidence because like all judgment is in Christ right now. Um, and so we have to just be careful when we look at like, wow, this is the judgment of the Lord on a nation. It's like, is it like, I don't know. Cause Jesus bore my sin and he's bearing the sins of the world. Um, but when the judgment finally comes, it will, it will not be a flood. Uh, and in fact, in Peter, we're told it will be a fire and it'll be a purifying, cleansing, redeeming, restoring, destroying fire. It's going to be interesting. And yeah. Um, so, one so on that I, note, have a good day. One, one <laughs> so. more thing I noticed, Jason, is in, I think it was 822, it says, I will not destroy the, the earth and we'll still have seasons and days and times until, as long as the earth endures. In tonight's passage? Is that what you said? Yeah, tonight's passage. Eight, eight. 822. Um, just this yeah. Topic. Yeah, it says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Except on that one, I think it endures for some reason. I didn't notice that before. So, I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear what you said. Could you say that? I just noticed while? it says, as long as the earth endures. Mm -hmm. I had never noticed that before. Yeah. Um, so was that... Like you're just making, you're just observing it or is yeah. there, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. I just yeah. noticed that as long as, the, well, you know, I said to Megan oh, a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, maybe Jesus is going to wait until we totally destroy the earth before he comes back. <laughs> she goes, I don't know. I mean, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, <laughs> here's a fun thought. Uh, there could, there's an asteroid that's coming to earth like next week. Like it'll be real close. You know, like there's those kinds of things where it's like, um, we look at the world and there's all kinds of cataclysmic events that seem to be on, a, on, a, on their way. Um, and like, you can look to those things that are completely outside of your control and just be like, uh, I don't what's happening. Or you can just say like, as long as the earth endures, like I am going to hold on to this promise from the Lord. Like, I don't have to, I don't have to fear these things, but I know what I'm supposed to do. And even in Noah's commands here, like that God gives to Noah, like tend the earth. I told Adam to tend the earth. Now you tend the earth. And that continues on even now. And so one of the, one of the things that like I am grieved by with like my heritage growing up in the church is like, you know, we just looked at creation care as just a like who cares it's all going to burn but but god cares like and god the That's corruption of humanity corrupting the earth led to the flood like god clearly cares about this so we should care like, we thought it was like moving deck chairs on the titanic you know that's what we said yeah trying to try to be nice to the earth because it's all going down <laughs> right and i can understand i can understand how we get there how we make that decision. Um, but I also understand like, we still have to live here in the meantime. <laughs> like, yeah, well, I've, I've, you know, I've changed. I've changed. I used, I, I used to think like that though. Yeah. But I, I do, I think like we should be taking care of the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. We should respect it. 
yeah, that's part of the stewardship is like, this isn't my earth. Mm -hmm. It's God's earth. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I get to, I get to enjoy the blessings of it. So I should take care of it. So, yeah. Uh, I saw some waving over there. Jay, did you have a question? <laughs> Stop. No, no, I do. She's too embarrassed to ask I'm not it, embarrassed. Though. Is I it about dinosaurs? It. No. <laughs> it's about no. unicorns? <laughs> yes, That's... actually. No, just kidding. It's but um, really quick, though, I did have a question. So um, I noticed today when you're going through um, chapter 7 and verse 15, it says, pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them. Um, and that was interesting to me um, because I uh, just thinking of like the Genesis or we're in Genesis thinking of like, um, like the creation account, right. Where like it talks about um, like God breathing the breath of life into mm -hmm. humans um, and how that is like a different experience than the way he created um, animals. And so, I don't know. I just was wondering if you know, if like that's the same, like, yeah, I don't. Yeah. She wants to know if they'll end up in heaven like we will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a different question. <laughs> that's a different question, but it's an important question. Um, yes. I, I don't think it's the same. Okay. But I do think what the writer is intending to tell us here is like every creature that is not in, living in the sea. Mm, okay. Every creature that breathes air is okay. coming to the, the ark. So like fish don't have to come to the ark because they don't breathe air. So does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's really what the writer is getting at because the creation of the first man and first woman like forming out of the dirt and breathing into his nostrils, like there's a, a distinct way that, the, that God created humanity that is different than the animals that he spoke into existence. Yeah. Um, so I think he's talking more about how they breathe here uh to answer the question about will have animals be in heaven um one of the things that we have to like and we'll get to this in like seven years when we get to revelation but um <laughs> the uh the new heavens and the new earth mm. that's that's what eternity looks like heaven yeah. and earth and so yeah. when we talk about will animals be in heaven that's i don't think i don't know but will animals be on the new earth? Why wouldn't they be? It's earth. It's a new earth. Like there is like, it would make sense that animals would be on the earth because on the earth, we need animals. Like we need birds and we need bees to make fruit and vegetables. Like we need them. So yes, I do think animals will be in eternity. Will your pet be in eternity with you i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't know um but like i mean god cares enough about animals to say i want to rescue these animals from the corruption of humanity and i'm going to bring them to the ark so i don't think god would just give up on the animals he made so even for all of eternity it's his work then they're awesome dogs are so cool i love my dogs and i i would i would think heaven would be real boring if we didn't have dogs or birds and how beautiful birds are like yeah there's a lot so it's part of god's gift to us so good, good questions and good segment or segue question to the future but so yeah any other questions I do, but I'll let somebody else go first if they have something. Mine's just kind of a kind of a jump off of what she asked. Okay. All right. Well, I okay. don't go ahead. So so the question that I had was, okay, so I, I understand what you're saying about about, you know, okay, so they breathe air, but why? So I don't believe that that the Bible was written like the words that are used in the Bible are by accident. So with that said, why would the Bible or, or the, why would the person that wrote the set use the term breath of life, the same term that was used with Adam and Eve and that, why not just say that every animal on the earth was in the ark? Um, well, 
because not every animal that is on the earth, because that does include fish. Maybe so, I should like, you, walk upon the earth. Yeah, you could say every animal that was on the land. Um, yeah, well, um, let me see here. I'm going to open uh, a, what am I looking for? There we go. Um, let me see, Genesis. Genesis seven, was it seven fifteen? Yeah. Yeah. Breath of life. Visual copy. So I have this cool Bible app. That's not what I wanted. That um, <laughs> the it does these word studies. Yeah. Um, so part of the challenge for Hebrew is Hebrew words mm -hmm. carry a lot of weight. Right. So one word will do a lot of work. Like it's, it's not as specific a language as English. Uh, okay. And so, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to do a little, like little Hebrew study here <laughs> on the fly. So, um, so here we have Ruach Chaim, which is breath of life. Um, so let's go back to Genesis chapter two. So interesting. Let me see here. And in Genesis 2, the word for breath is actually a different word. Okay. It is nismat. Now, oh. what... What does this mean? Um, let me see here. Study. This is where the super nerdiness comes into play because I get charts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, charts. Um, so this is tied to um, I think that dry line that had the breath of life, but it is the same in Genesis 7 2. Nishmat, yeah. Interesting. So in Genesis 7, 15, mm -hmm. this is where we get a little confused. In 7, 15, it's Ruach Nasaim. In uh, 7, 22, it is uh, Nesa'ama um, as breath instead of Ruach. So um, interesting. The... There, there's some distinction here that is happening. So I, I would have to dig a little bit deeper into what's okay. going on between these two things. But um, yeah, most of the time, because I can click on the most uses of this word. Yeah. And then it will break it down for me here and all these other Bible verses. Um, most of the time, what's happening with seven with the uh, nes, Nesama is movement of air and just breathing. Okay. Uh, it seems the breath of the, no, the breath of the almighty, the breath of God, the breath. So, yeah, I don't know. I would have to dig a little bit deeper, but okay. the, the distinction between the human and the animal from Genesis one and two, there is a distinction. Yeah. So I, how the use is being put together here in this passage would need a little bit more digging into. And I didn't see in the commentaries that I was referencing, like they didn't make a, any kind of like reference back to like, Got it. Saying, like this could be like humanity. So <laughs> like, it's not a question that I asked as I was studying because it wasn't something that like I saw anybody referencing in the research mm -hmm. so it makes sense 
Yeah. Um, but what I mean, it's interesting. It's a good question. Yeah, it is interesting. What is your fancy nerdy Bible app called? Uh, it's called Logos. Logos? Yeah. And it, uh, it is not cheap. So uh, <laughs> okay, good to know. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, and Sydney, you are in ministry, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you are um, like preparing lessons and that kind of stuff, it's a great resource, really great. Mm -hmm. uh, but but getting into it is a little, can be costly. So if you okay. go to logos.com, um, you can find different packages, like okay. different bases, base packages and stuff. But yeah, when I was at Northwest, uh, Wally Kowalski was my professor. Uh, and he's like, hey, everybody, I have this really great deal with this new Bible company. Um, and you can get the scholar package for $75. So I did. And now it's like $1,000. So like, I was very blessed when I was able to get in. So wow. Yeah. Um, but it's awesome. It's come, it, it's been just a great godsend for me. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Did you have another question? I was being smart. I was just going to say, what's your email and password? Yeah. So yeah. Can you, can you share that with me? <laughs> no, this isn't Netflix, my friends. So <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> mainly because I don't want you highlighting my books. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from anybody? I uh, I appreciate your guys's. Please Sandra, did you? Yeah, I think Sandra was trying to talk, but she's muted. Oh. Yeah. Ask to unmute. You have to unmute herself. Unmute me. There, you, are. there you go. Okay. <laughs> I've never used this before, so I was curious. How old were um, Noah's boys? What's that? How old were they? Did they stay anywhere? Um, you know, in this. Were they, they were possibly. married. Were they triplets? I don't think they were triplets. Let me. Somebody told me they were, and I thought. They, they were married. There was no children. And did Noah have other children before that went off into the. Yeah, those are those are good questions. I'm just pulling up the genealogy here to I'm see. I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so. Lamech had a son, lived 595 altogether. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So when he was 500, he at least had Shem. Okay. So we don't know if they were triplets, but at least one of them was born when Noah was 500. So at the time of the was he 600? Blood, the boys would have been 100 years old. The oldest, at least, would have been 100 years old. So, yeah, they probably, they, it makes sense if they would have had children. Um, so, are there families coming on the ark? There, there's some un. Well, that's why I was wondering why the, you know, what, were they just young, you know, like teenagers? But if there's that 100 year thing. Yeah. Because people so. did things differently back then when they had a thousand years to live. Yeah, yeah, the planning was a little different. <laughs> <laughs> but I was curious because they didn't have any children mentioned anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking after the flood to see when they had kids. Um, after the flood, Noah lived another 350 years. And... It doesn't say how old the sons were when they had kids or when they died. Okay, I was, I was just curious if you yeah. knew. I hadn't heard anything, but I hadn't, you know, hadn't remembered back that far. Yeah, no. Um, the, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't get into that. So they do have sons. They are listed. Yeah, and they were married and that, that, yeah. no. And then of course, the descendants after that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 
this okay. well, just heads curious. up if, as you guys are reading genesis 10 and 11 like genesis 10 like really does like talk about like these are how all the nations were created yeah. It's yeah. pretty interesting. It's a genealogy and it's super boring in most of our brains, but it's actually really interesting. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, there is no specific. It just so, it, it just so happens that they start off 10 with, with Jephthah and not Shem. Uh, yeah, because there, there's a reason. Um, is the It starts with Japheth and Ham and then goes back to Shem. Because we are going to follow the line of Shem. So the writer will do that. So like we did the same thing with Cain's descendants and then came back to Seth. And now we're going to go back to Japheth and Ham and then come back to Shem. And we'll see that again with Esau. We'll see his descendants and then we'll come back to Jacob. Um, so like that will be consistent throughout Genesis. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So Jason, uh, you know, I, I find uh, Genesis very, very, very mysterious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you, you probably read it a couple of times. What do you, <laughs> do you still find it mysterious? Oh yeah, yeah. There's so I much. Mean, and there, because the writer doesn't tell us everything we want to know, it's, yeah. it, it is really easy to fall into um, thinking hypothetically or trying to make sense of things so they fit in our brain because we want a clear, easy story. Um, yeah. But the best stories are mysterious. It the is. best stories don't tell you everything. Because you know when when I read when I was reading ten I was wondering they made no mention of any of the wives. Yeah. No. Oh. In this genealogy. <laughs> Like okay, you know, was that not important to mention, or or I don't know. It's just it's just very mysterious uh, the way it is broken down. Yeah, uh, Tony, you make a good point. And culturally, um, you know, it was patriarchal, so they focused on the men. Yeah, and so that is part of the culture of the time. So. Um, I mean, they had to have had wives and we really don't see like genealogy, like noting women in genealogies until a little later on in, um, as we see like the plurality of wives for Abraham and for Jacob, like we start to see the wives dynamic and the concubine dynamic um, there. And then we see in the you know genealogy of David, as we read history, we see, hey, here's Rahab and Ruth. Um, there's women in the line of David that are important. Um, and then in, again, in uh, Jesus and his, um, his genealogy, we do see women highlighted, um, but it's, yeah, they don't usually talk about the wives of the, the husbands. So, but there are women around. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, you guys, that uh, this is uh, these are great questions. I love this stuff, and I I could talk all night, but I also um, so am tired. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, sure <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one. So um, I will. Let's wrap up, and then we'll come back next week. And so we're gonna have the super fun genealogy to work through. It's gonna be great. So um, okay. and uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll end the video here and.